pretty engaging pretty well. I'm going to back this chair up. Anybody watching right now? And here we go. This is Eric Levitt with another installment of Bluegrass Legends, Dicks, and Lore. See how fast I can say that today? <coughs> Thanks um, for joining us again. Good to be here. Tell, um, us, tell us what's on your mind about bluegrass today. I would like to um, <clears throat> give some verbal recognition to several people that <clears throat> really do need to be named in any series that's done on bluegrass. Um, to, um, what, what, how do you say? To do them justice? No, to give them justice ain't the right word. To, to give them recognition that that's do them for for how they've helped shape the music. Now we can start with the father of bluegrass music, who is Bill Monroe. Um, <clears throat> and what influenced Bill Monroe? Well, we've talked about Bill Monroe a little bit already. Um, Bill uh, was a <coughs> Kentucky boy, <coughs> and. Um, he, um, he started playing with um, his brother, uh, Charlie. He also had an older brother named Birch. Birch Monroe was, a, was an old time fiddle player. And, um, but the real, um, the real nucleus of it in the very beginning was Bill and Charlie. Now, there are several things that influenced Bill in in uh, making bluegrass what it is, and um, there's there's the uh, the hymns from the backwoods. There's the folk songs from from the mountains. Um, there's also a little bit of influence um, of um, probably New Orleans jazz, uh, which is another very American form of music. Um, Bill put quite a few things in together that synergized it together to make it be a distinctive style of music in itself. When I first heard bluegrass, I I was asking, well, what, what really is this music? Is it country? Is it folk? Um, and the answer I got was, well, it's bluegrass. I said, I know, I know, but, but what is bluegrass? And it took me a little while to, to uh, understand that bluegrass is its own distinct type of music. It, it's, it's a little bit of all those things, but thrown together, it becomes a very distinct type of music. How about ragtime? Did you say, did you say there's any ragtime sort of well, Scott Joplin-ish kind of? I, well, maybe, maybe very distant-wise. I wouldn't say very directly. Um, you play ragtime often on a four-string banjo, just like you played Dixie Jazz, but bluegrass, you need that fifth string. And it's a completely different tuning, so it's really a different instrument. Same, same sound, but a different instrument. Tune differently, play differently. Anyhow, I want to give very special mention of the man that I feel <clears throat> probably influenced Bill Monroe more than anybody else, and that was his Uncle Penn. Um, his, his Uncle Penn's first name was Pendleton, and his last name was um, Vanderbilt. I believe I pronounced it right. And um, in other words, there's um, Sounds like there's a little bit of Dutch in his name. Um, Bill Monroe's Uncle Penn, whom uh, Bill adored, by the way, um, was an old-time mountain fiddler who was quite known in the region. And um, it was the fiddle tunes that Uncle Penn used to play that, that Bill would, would listen to as a youngster that really uh, had a very major effect on Bill and, and 
got him into what, what became known as bluegrass. Now, Bill created bluegrass for the mandolin. And um, there was already old time folk, folksy mountain hillbilly stuff that was played on mandolins. Um, when Bill arranged his style, he gave it that um, a very distinctive sound, a bluesy type sound. Um, you know, that, that wasn't done before. That, that made bluegrass so, so specialized. And, um, and then the offbeat vamp that I talked about last week, uh, when you're doing something like... That's what the mandolin is, is doing when it's not playing a break. It's doing the backup, which is an offbeat. The vamping is offbeat. Like a drum, very much like a drum. When the mandolin isn't playing the break, it's, it's doing the offbeat vamping, um, very much acting uh, as a drum. Um, but Uncle Penn um, played, wrote and played some very, very fabulous fiddle tunes that, that would make your hair stand on end. And, in 1972, Bill Monroe came out with an album uh, consisting exclusively of Uncle Penn tunes. And I'm going to do one of them for you right now, okay? Now, did Uncle Penn record? Mm-hmm. Um, so you can find, if you're a collector, you can find 78s? Well, it was a DECA, uh, DECA or MCA release, so it's not extinct. Mm -hmm. It's out there, uh, long out of print, of course. But when I first got that album, <coughs> it, it made my hair stand on end. When Uncle Penn recorded in the 50s? I'm sorry, I'm going to nail he, down this. He, um, no, this would have been before the 50s. Before the 50s. Before the 50s. Before the 50s. Cause, cause yeah, we're talking probably um, probably the 30s. All right. So that a precursor to bluegrass. Precursor to bluegrass. Major influence. But, Uncle Penn, okay. But, it was very, very authentic um, uh, hill folk, hill tunes, and oh, here's some of that. and um, um, one member of my band that I had at the time, I had a band. I played in a band called Full Kentucky Load. My guitar player said when he first got that album, he couldn't eat lunch. He just, he was spellbound. And that's about the way I was too. It, 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 the stuff was gorgeous. Well, I'm going to do one tune from that album uh, that was titled uh, "Going Up Caney." And um, now this isn't strictly bluegrass. This is pre-bluegrass. Well, it is, they, but they do it bluegrass. Okay. Bill Monroe's band did it bluegrass. Okay, and so you'll do it in the Bill Monroe style. Yeah, but okay. but Uncle Penn, uh, they they did it. They they did it very similar to the way Uncle Penn played it. And um, I think if, if there was anything that was the early bluegrass, it would have been Uncle Penn's fiddle playing. Um, Going Up Caney, by the way, is a very easy uh, song to sing. It only has three words, Going Up Caney. <laughs> uh, and what's Caney? Caney Creek. Caney Creek um, uh, over there in Kentucky. Bigger creeks of that state. All right, sing along, all of you out there. As, as I say, it's a very easy song to sing. Only three words in the whole lyric. Hey, going up Caney, hey ho, go up Caney, hey.
rousing tune. Going up Caney. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe you caught my, my little off. Uh, I had one, uh, I missed one chord by, by, by Fred there. It sounded a little cacophonic there. Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, he did a few other tunes on there. I'm not going to play them, but uh, I do actually one on my dulcimer called The Methodist Preacher, which is a very uh, pretty, pretty tune. Um, the whole the whole album is just just gorgeous, and um, um, so what one? Uh, let's see. What where can we go from here? Um, oh yeah, I'm going to um, do another song that Bill Monroe recorded um, in full recognition of his uncle Penn, called Uncle Penn. Uh, regarded by many as the national anthem of bluegrass. Oh. Uncle Penn. Um, like let me do Uncle Penn for you. He came out, of course, uh, uh, with that one on a single. Actually, uh, Going Up Caney, I think, was put on a single. Um, but here's Uncle Penn. And I'm going to do the whole song. Because um, he's worthy of a whole song. We won't just do bits and excerpts of it. We'll do the whole song. Unfortunately, you don't have a fiddle here to kick it off with the, the fiddle. The people would come from far away to dance all night through the break of day. The call would holler, do see do no Uncle Penn, ready to go. Late in the evening, about sundown, high in the hill above the town. Play the fiddle, Lord. How it could ring, you could hear it talk, you could hear it sing. Talk, you could hear it. You can hear it. That was actually uh, part of a tune that Uncle Penn played called Jenny Lynn, which was actually mentioned in the lyrics of the song. All written by Bill Monroe, the king of bluegrass. And that was his tribute to his uncle, his beloved Uncle Penn. Um, so another uh, individual that I would like to acknowledge um, is a very, very accomplished banjo player that uh, followed um, kind of after Earl Scruggs, not too far after, maybe a decade or, a decade or two after, uh, Bill Keith. 
Um, full name, William Bradford Keith. Uh, Bill Keith revolutionized banjo picking so that you could play every note a melody note. And prior to that, like with the Scrug style, very hard driving style, you got a lot of arpeggios in Scrug style, a lot of forward rolls, forward and backward rolls. Um, and um, in, the, in the tunes, excuse me, in the tunes, the melody comes out, but camouflaged by all these fill-in notes. There's these, these hundreds and hundreds of, of fill-in notes that make it all, that burst out and make it what it is. Well, what Bill Keith did was he took what was already there and he rearranged it so you could play every note, a melody note, which means you're going to have more scales than arpeggios. Um, in other words, Bill Keith arranged banjo playing so you could play fiddle tunes pretty much the way you would play them on a fiddle. And, um, for example, there's a, whole, there's a G scale. Um, on a piano, you can play a G scale and all the, all the notes are right in line. I'm not saying the piano is an easy instrument, it's not. <laughs> it's considered the second hardest instrument after a violin. But, <clears throat> well, banjo isn't necessarily an easy instrument either. Um, but um, on a piano, you're going da 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 It's all in logical procession, progression, um, which is the right word there. Right, right in a row, okay? On a banjo, look what you have to do to play a G scale. Now you notice here I'm jumping around and with the right hand here I'm skipping, I'm not going one string right in a row. You can't just go... That's an arpeggio. And that's a, like a broken chord. To do a scale, if you notice on the right hand, it's jumping all over also. No order. No logical order. It's just every other one which away. Um, that's what Bill Keith did um, <clears throat> to uh, banjo music. And when he presented that, I think what, what when when he went public with it, the first time he did was that was at the Newport Folk Festival when he actually won a contest. It was in the early 60s, I believe very early 60s and he played a fiddle tune called Devil's Dream. Um, I'm not going to play that for you right now because I haven't played it in years and I'm a little rusty on it but what can I give you as a demonstration? Maybe Cripple Creek. Uh, if I were playing it Scruggs style I'd be going If I was playing it more Keith style I'd be going of like the Bill Cheatham. Do you hear how it just every note's a melody there? Do -do 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 -do. Kind of went back to Scrug style at the end there when I when I closed it out. So anyway, Bill Keith, as far as I know, is still alive. He's in his 80s now, and um, he was just a kid when all this was happening. He was a young. I was a kid. Yeah, he wasn't. I was a kid. Uh, I'm I'm almost 68 in a few days. He's well in his 80s. And last I heard, he's still still making um, making his fancy tuners. If you look here on on the back of the banjo here, uh, see these knobs um, on these tuners? Uh, Bill Keith invented those. 
which is kind of a simpler method than the one that Scruggs did. Scruggs had something similar, um, but what Earl Scruggs did, um, instead of having it these where, where they're set like that, and I'll demonstrate them for you in a minute, although I'm having a little trouble with them. Um, Scruggs, Scruggs would drill a hole in the neck, of, in, the, in the peg head of the banjo, and, and the, it was a cam action, C-A-M, like a cam action, where, and you had to put two special pegs there where you go bing, bang, 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 where it would agitate against the string. Well, Bill Keith simplified it so you don't have to mess that up like that and just go. Ain't that groovy? <laughs> Very good. I'm having a little problem with mine because they're not they're not setting right. I might have to get them uh, lubricated or something. So that's Bill Keith. Let's see who else do I want to mention. I do want to make mention. Um, let's make let's get one one more acknowledgement here um, to a couple of men who brought their their music from Arkansas to. California, and their names were Vern and Ray. I have to say something about Vern and Ray, and they're both departed now. Um, Vern Williams and Ray Park, and uh, their sons are, are around. Um, um, Vern's son uh, Delbert and um, Ray's son Larry. If they're hearing this, I'm sure they'll appreciate that I'm acknowledging their dads <coughs> in this presentation but they were great Vern and Ray were great they were great and and you take any any bluegrass combination any bluegrass combination and and you hear Vern and Ray and their harmony is a class in itself there it's so piercing that that does make your hair stand on end you'd never heard anything like it and, and you can go online and, and find them. And um, there was a time when uh, banjo player Herb Peterson was playing banjo with them. Um, Rick Shebb also played with them at one time. And um, Rick, Shebb, uh, Rick Shebb is a Berkeley banjo picker. Uh, Herb Peterson's a Californian. Um, but let me just tell you a little story about how Vern and Ray brought their music over here. They met here in California, in uh, kind of the Sacramento and Fresno area, and they were both born in Arkansas. They never knew each other in Arkansas. They, they both met here in California. And I'm trying to remember what they did for a living, uh, one of them I think was a truck driver, the other one was a vending, a vending machine installer, and they didn't, they didn't play this music for a living. It wasn't their full-time job. They did it, they did it as um, for the love of the music, and yet they were great. They were great. Um, Vern, Vern was the mandolin player, and, and Ray was a guitar player. Ray also played a fiddle. A um, little story about Vern. Uh, Vern was born in Deer, Arkansas. Deer, D, uh, like the animal, Deer, Arkansas. Anyone out there ever heard of Deer, Arkansas? I don't think, I don't think so. They're, they're, they're almost not on the map. It's like a little hamlet. He was born in a cabin in Deer, Arkansas, which is so in the middle of nowhere in those Ozarks that your nearest neighbor you probably had to walk five miles to. I don't know how far they had to walk to the nearest country store. But that'll give you an idea of, of, of I'm trying to think if there's something. Let me do one Vernon Ray song and we'll take it out with this. So we right. get pretty close here. All right, yeah. Um, what's the name of this song? Um, uh, home, hometown. Um, um, can you remember the name of it? Recording and when? Hmm? Um, they did record it. Um, oh, Cabin on a Mountain. Oh, right. Cabin, Cabin on a Mountain. 
and I hope that my voice can hit those 40s, high notes. 50s, when did they report it? In the 50s. It was in 1957, I think. And and when Werner Ray met out here and they formed, they got together, they went to Nashville and they recorded for Starday, for Starday Records. They didn't record very much. They recorded a little bit. I don't know, you audio files. Yeah, it's all in the, uh, in the vault, right? Well, let's see if I can pull off Cabin on a Mountain here for you. I'm out of tune. Okay, I get to watch the tune again. Because I messed with these, remember? That's right, so it's always we knew that. We were going to say that. Yeah, I have to get, do some work on those. Okay, I think we're ready. Uh, get back in the position here. Cabin on a mountain. another that's another uh, little uh, little bit of bluegrass there one more name I'm gonna just mention we can't discuss them but right at the moment we're done but um, I'm gonna mention Tommy Gerald um, go online and, and, and look up some Tommy Gerald that's old-time mountain music that's also pre bluegrass Tommy Gerald is a very key figure in in the whole realm of mountain music check out Tommy Gerald and why is that why is Tommy Joe? Um, his style of playing the fiddle um, and the old time banjo uh, that would accompany his fiddle playing and his singing. Um, it's, um, it's also uh, one of a kind. Um, it, Tommy Gerald defines old timey mountain music. Is he also pre bluegrass as well as post? Oh yeah, but, but, but old timey uh, still exists. And when did he start in? Uh, Who was he getting his name out there? You know what? I, I can't answer 30s that. 40s again? Um, I'm not sure. No, I'm not no, sure. I'm going to um, close you on another installment. Okay, we'll, we'll do some Tommy Jarrell later on. All right, thank you very much, Eric. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. See you next week. <laughs>